fun doing this one. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, the first of many, we hope. We, well, the first of many here. We did a, we did a session in uh, October at Taylor Street Roosters. You were there. Anybody? A few people were there. Uh, it was a great event. This is the, the, the second event in that series. And uh, we're so grateful for the ICO for opening the door and saying, come on in and use our space. Uh, they're doing this uh, free of charge to us, and so we can really take advantage of, of their hospitality and, and their space. Uh, they're extremely friendly people. Um, tonight's session is about water. We have two uh, preeminent people that I know in the industry who are here to talk about water. Um, and I'm going to introduce Ronnie Billerman from Belgium, who is who did a presentation for us last week at the ASC conference in Dublin, and it was really, really cool. Um, and then followed, following Ronnie will be uh, Master Corner Dashwood, UK Barista Champion 2015, 14, and 12. Um, they're not conflicting opinions about water. They're just two different positions about water. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, we're complementing. Complementing. Excellent. That's a better word. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is hold your questions till uh, after Maxwell's session, because I think we we will have to move through a bit quicker. Okay, is that okay with you? Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, write it down, and then we'll do them at the end. Any questions before we begin? Over to Ron. Yeah. This mic. That should be a little bit more noisy now. From my side, I will have. Uh, I was limited in time, so I'll be a short presentation, meaning the basic we should know about water, because water is basically the forgotten element in all our coffee brewing, but it has such a serious impact. Together with the SCAE, the um, WBC, and uh, multiple players in coffee world, we're looking to establish ideal. Um, was it double motion or double mic? Did you have double sound? Okay. No, you're good. All right. Uh, sorry. So we are looking about why we can bring coffee and water closer together and, and study what impact they have on each other. And up till now, most focus was mainly to how to create a tasty coffee. And too often was forgotten that we use equipment and this equipment should also be healthy. Because at the end, we're creating something that our customers will be drinking. And that should not be forgotten. The quality in the cup is super important <laughs> at all levels. Now, what is the basics of a delicious coffee experience? First of all, let's say service, environment, ambience. How often we don't see people coming back from Italy, oh, I had the best coffee, ideal, oh, delicious, and they come back with a package of 100% Robusta, dark roast, and at home it's uh, mm, mm, not bad. Same point, if uh, the bartender comes along and he says, uh, three euros, that's your coffee, or he comes along, I picked for you the finest cherries and I made your coffee, well, you will be exhausted. There's this mixed difference on the coffee. Another part of it is, of course, the, the, the choice of coffee we make. Uh, we're not going to make the wow coffee if we go to the basics of the basics quality. And quite too often, it's forgotten that maybe paying one euro more for a kilo, it's not much difference in the cost of a cup, but it makes a huge difference in the drink for a customer, how you will bring them and how they will come back to your place. Another part is, of course, choosing the right brewing method. Meaning you can go for espresso, you can go for filter coffee, you can go for the traditional slow or, or cold brews. Different coffees have different reactions. And some coffees are great in a slow coffee and not that much in an espresso. They lose their added value. So there also it's keeping the balance. And then the often forgotten and mainly forgotten point, water and water management. Now, I don't put one bigger than the other because it's a wheel. And if one doesn't work, the whole system breaks. So every point in the chain has its importance and should be supported. Now, what do we know about water? Most of us learned H2O, that's a classical in school. Well, H2O only exists in laboratory. 
H2O, pure water, is everybody's friend. And on the way, it takes everybody with it. So you will never find pure H2O. We know it's coming out of the tap. Sometimes we know about taste and odor. We heard something about chlorine, impurity, dirt, and also TDS, minerals, certainly scale. That's something everybody knows. So these are the, the basics we know about water, but more than that, we're missing the clue. Now, if you look at the six essentials of brewing coffee, three of them are related to water, good water quality, correct water ratio to the coffee, and the ideal temperature, because they all have impact on your coffee brewing. The standard, it takes about six months intensive picking selecting the coffees these days because we're not going for the standard we're going for the high premium coffees we pick it very fine it's about six months average before the coffee is roasted and available for the consumer out of that bean maximum 30 percent we can extract now the ideal is somewhere in between 18 and 22 percent and still that only represents about 1.2 to 1.5 percent of my cup all the rest is water but also notice that from all the six month intensive labor and selecting and picking we only need one to two maybe five minutes to make it a wow or really to break it down to almost nothing anymore a waste of energy so it's quite important later on we will have at maxwell the tasting of the coffee the easy way that i'm using to show differences on the impact of water is about tea Tea doesn't hide anything. Tea shows really what's in the water. If you take the left part, we have black tea. The first one is with hard water, black, as dark as can be as coffee. The right one is more brownish, clean. Similar, you will have with green tea, from a dark to a clean white tea. Now we have to respect one point. Sometimes culture has also its origins. If you talk with the Turkish people, their black tea has to be black. So this is why left, we have to respect it. But if you talk to a tea sommelier, he wants to have that finest aroma coming out. And he's looking to the other side. But also if you look on the top of the glass, the far left, it has some greasy, it's not delicious to drink. Whereas the right one is a clean cup of tea. Similar in the green one, the far left, I won't tell you where I've been, but looks like that sometimes. And on the right, it's a nice clean cup you love to drink. And you will have all the finest aromas, all the fine tastes coming out. And this is where the kind of water you're gonna be using has direct impact. Now on coffee, we can cover up some of the defects of water. Now, is our job as a barista to cover up the weakness of the water or to get the best out of my coffee? I prefer to take the best out of my coffee, get the finest aromas and really astonish my customers by that selection of coffee I've been making all the way. Another image in here is um, classical filter coffee, pour over, exactly the same coffee, the same grinding, only difference was the water quality. One was sodium softened water, the other was hard water. You can notice that the right cup has all, is almost full, where the left is about 30% below that. Because we know that this kind of water takes longer to get through the coffee, has a different reaction, which makes that if I put my ideal brewing between that 18 and 22%, yet it took 30% longer to get through, I get over the edge of the bitterness. So the only thing I have is a bitter coffee. And these are the small details we should be aware of, that when a coffee, a customer came to your place and he bought a nice coffee, and then the next week he comes back and says, that coffee wasn't what I've been drinking here. We look at all the details, but we all never think about the water. So it is still important to ask your customer, what kind of water are you using? Do you have a central sodium softener? Do you have whatever? It is important to know. It's not your fault that coffee didn't taste delicious at his place. 
there are different acts in it. Another typical issue is, of course, scaling of the machine, where at the top you have a perfect spray all over the batch, and at the bottom you will simply make one channel through the coffee and never take its full potential. Now, there's also another part. By focusing on water treatment, because I don't want my machine to be scaled up too often, and still we create other problems. Left is, of course, the good, the ideal world. In the middle, my machine is scaled up, it fills the bad. But too often, we get up to the right, which is the ugly, meaning using the wrong water treatment can damage my, work, my coffee machine up to a point, which is today a, one, a point which is very accurate, is metal corrosion. This way, heavy metals get into the water. Now, remember, your customer is drinking that coffee. So be aware of using the right technology. Now, if you want to play at home with your coffees and do simple, similar to what Maxwell is going to do and I'm telling you about, you can easily try out some, go to the supermarket, look on the label of the bottle, check its consistency, <coughs> pick out different kinds of water, try your tap water from home and go ahead, brew coffee, brew tea. You will learn yourself quite easy and even learn also your customers when they come to your place. Look, I'll make the same cup with two waters. This is the impact. You can show it. It's easy. And then it's for you up to learn which one would be the best for my coffee. Because yes, some coffees will have an ideal floral and taste at this kind of water. But others might prefer another kind of water. This is nature, this is reality. So if we talk about water, the first thing on our mind is scale. And that's the problem that has to be solved. This is typically business. My coffee shop has to, has to run continuously. I don't want to break down. OK, but then we have to know what's the cause of it. So one part of it, we're lucky in the European community. If we call or we send an email or even on the internet quite often, you take contact with your water supplier. They are obliged to provide you a full detailed report on what's in the water. They test the water almost daily. The report you will have is mainly an overall for three months or six months, but it gives you guide, quite good image on what you're getting out of the tap. And based on that, you can decide where you want to go to with what kind of water treatment or what you need to do or don't need to do. Some areas don't just need a carbon filter. Other areas are more complex and need more dramatic uh, impact. So the, the points we're looking mainly to is the pH, it's the total hardness, alkalinity, chlorides. It's a big factor these days, which is more and more important in the picture. We also have the look at the phosphor in the water. That's more a reference. And some metals, copper, chrome, and so on. Now, the water quality is very well protected and serviced. These guys do a great job at the source on the way up to the point where you are going to sell it or offer it to your customer, there's quite some things that can happen. So why should we filter our great quality tap water? Well, we all had once that little brownish coffee coming out of tap. No need for coffee, greens, beans. It's already there, just not as tasteful. Um, when you remove that little filter on top of your tap, you want the left top picture, you will have these dirts really on the filter. You don't want this in your machine because that's going to block up your system, your expensive investment. And reality is, if you take the far right picture and then the bottom one, this is the tube of our water distribution. It's nature. We cannot avoid it. It's reality. So through the day, it's not a problem. But from time to time, these deposits get loosened, and then it's an issue. So we should rather protect our equipment, our investment, but also our customers from these kind of things that do happen. Now, there's one reality in the whole business. What respect or what treatment, there is no one shoe fits all. There's not one single technology that can solve everything, every need. <laughs> so 
be aware of it. That oops, you jumping away. Okay, uh, be aware of it that we have to look at really what the water is, what we're going to do with it, how we're going to brew our coffee or our tea, and then select the right opportunity. So what we're looking at is optimal coffee extraction, optimal equipment protection. There's one magical word in nature, equilibrium. Nature always looks for an equilibrium, a balance in itself. If it's a pure H2O, it doesn't like to be alone. That's its nature. It will look for other things to take with them. Depending on temperature, we can get nature move faster, but still brewing coffee is also that water looking for a balance between what's around him and what itself contains. So that's a magical word, equilibrium at all levels. Nature will always go back to a certain level of equilibrium or balance. <laughs> Optimal coffee brewing, healthy coffee equipment. It is no longer a nice to have, but it's a must have. We are capable of doing that. So it's not because I don't like or I'm not willing to. No, we can do it. So we should do it in our business. Now, what do we know about water? One thing we all know in one country a little bit more than another, it's chlorine or chloramine. When you drink water off the tap, it has some taste of chlorine. Now that's added to the water by the company to keep it healthy all the way through. Now, the good point is it's easy to remove a good carbon filter. You'll take it out. Part of the UK is already using chloramine, a little bit like the US. And the only point is it smells even worse. You need more and it's harder to take away. But a good point still, a good carbon filter will do the job. So that's easily removable. You don't want it in your coffee machine because it's gonna give off taste to your coffee. But it also, when you heat it up, it creates uh, gases which are corrosive to your machine. So it needs to go out, carbon filter, definitely. Mainly we're gonna combine this with a, a dirt filter in one package. TDS, total dissolved solids. Quite easy to say if I take one liter of water, all the H2O is evaporated, all the dry stuff which is left behind. That's the TDS, all the dry material in the water. This is also what makes the water taste different in areas because they took different minerals all the way they've been deep wells or lakes or rivers where we took the water. This is also the base of the taste of the water. This is what you will find on the back of the label, on the labels on the back of your bottles, where it describes how much magnesium, calcium, and other minerals which are inside. TH, total hardness. Total hardness is basically the bricks in your water, which build the scale. Total hardness, it's a positive side, it's meaning the calcium and the magnesium are the biggest players, but you also have other minerals which will jump into that scale build up. When you test total hardness, you will test the presence of scale minerals in the water. Now on the right you see several uh, measurements, ppm, milligrams per liter, degrees Clark, grades per gallon, French degrees, they are all related to each other with a formula. But notice that if you go to the US, they speak in grace per gallon. Here in the UK, degrees Clark. Belgium, French degrees. Germany, German degrees. So make sure you talk the same language when you compare them. Or you might end up with strong, well, diff quite different results. Now, although scale, calcium and magnesium are my problem because they build up hard scale in my machine, I still need them. Because I need these soldiers to take the coffee, the oils, everything out of my coffee beans. I need some workers. Now, what we know is, thanks to studies, partially also by Maxwell, is about calcium has some extraction capacity, but limited. Magnesium has more power to extract. Yet, we have to look. Magnesium, yes, but not too much, because it has an overcapacity on power and tendency to, at certain levels, more extract 
the less pleasant oils and taste and aromas of my coffee. So here again, it's about knowing what's in the water and how far we can go. That might be the next generation, and I probably would expect Maxwell to challenge us to do something like that, where we can really point in a formula. But we have to know what's doing what. But we love these kind of challenges and laboratory work because that's given us more visually on what the water is really doing. Then the temporary hardness, carbonate hardness, but in reality, alkalinity. It's a little bit chemistry, but that's the way it goes. We can only talk about carbonate hardness or temporary hardness when it's linked with scale minerals in the water. But the test kit we're going to use to measure that is always measuring the alkalinity, independent if there are scale minerals or not. And this is quite often where your it goes wrong if there's a central sodium sulfate in front, for example, because then you don't have any bricks anymore, but you still measure the alkalinity. Alkalinity, mainly we'll measure that one in German degrees, but still we can use the same formulas to go to the other measurements. Now, even if we measure it in German degrees, if you have a catalog from an American machine in grains per gallon, it's quite close. You can almost convert one to one. Now, here again, alkalinity, carbonate hardness, it's a base of my problem. Yet, I need them. Because alkalinity is a natural way of water, the natural policeman in water, to keep everything in balance. It's the one who keeps water in equilibrium. It's the one who keeps the bad guys, like chlorides, under control. But it's also the one who says, OK, you get in, slow, fast, or no, I'm satisfied. I don't want you anymore, because I want to stay like I am. So some chlorides, great, I need them. Too many, I'm not going to be able to pick out these finest aromas. and typical acidic oils out of my coffee. So here again, it's about playing and learning about managing those. There is a tendency to say, we lack a little bit more chlorides, these are, uh, sorry, a uh, little bit more alkalinity in the water these days than previous. But then also we learn day to day, the water the chemistry, the water knowledge we have today. Oh, we just opened the box of Pandora a few years ago. Now we start in, finally to get deeper into the subject. Permanent hardness, that's a part of minerals, scale minerals, which will always stay in the water. So however you're going to heat it up, it's not going to build a hard scale. Yet some of those will get trapped in the scale. And that's why you have sometimes a blue scale deposit or a red or whatever color. <laughs> These are other minerals blocked inside the scale buildup. pH. The balance, equilibrium, seven is a holy grail, neutral. In coffee, we have a very narrow room to play, 6.7, 7.7. That's the ideal world. Higher, lower, we don't, that's not an, an ideal world. That's going to be issues. Yet, it's a tricky one. pH is like measuring temperature. I can measure here how hot it is. But it doesn't tell me what it takes to raise it one degree or lower it one degree. So it's about, yes, I want to know it. I want to check it. I want to challenge it. But for example, if you have a pure RO water, only putting your finger in the water will balance out the pH. Or even the cup might do it. So it's a tricky one to play. But here again, more chloride in the water, more sulfate a little bit with it. Lower alkalinity, lower pH, okay, I won't have scale buildup, but I increase the risk of corrosion and certainly metal corrosion. The picture on, on the screen are a little bit typical visuals, what you see when metal corrosion starts, is these little mushrooms at the outside, uh, discoloration of the boiler on the outside, which is coming. This is real, the first signals of metal corrosion inside. You know what's happening outside is also happening inside. And that is going to your coffee. Now, there is a recipe, an ideal world, a little bit like for fire, also on scale. You should have minerals, dirt, of which 
a lot of calcium, some carbonates, and that combined with energy is the basic of scale builder. Now, how can I handle that? Is we try to limit the triangle to the minimum. But remember, the more and more deeper we go into the water, the more serious it comes about keeping that in balance, a natural balance, because you can play with nature, you can put it away to one side or another side, but sooner or later, nature will come back to you. And this is, for example, the corrosion issue. So it's about bringing that up to a level in a natural equilibrium. What do we develop during coffee brewing? Well, we all know we create body, aroma, taste, color. These are all steps during the extraction. We know that in the beginning, we will first take out the best flavors, least bitterness. Go to the next step will be some acids and the average solubles. And then we get into the point where we rather don't like to be where the bitterness is taking over. Where the bitterness will kill everything you had in the before. So that's the point of no return. Well, that's the point we don't want to be anyway. So all these points on extraction is what we're going to look at. And how can we play on these games? For example, we can, well, we keep nature is about a balance, equilibrium. So it's, extraction is the same. We can enhance that by heating up the water, which makes all the molecules move faster. We can put more pressure on it. Same <laughs> results. It will push out every oil faster. But it's always about looking how and what, what base we're going to do it. So it's more about it. It's more getting more and more complex. But that's the fun about coffee. You have it in your fingertips till the last second. What do we know, do on minerals? This is a little bit the standard vision today. But we're always open to adjustment. Meaning, a TDS between 50 to 150. Below 50, we know that extraction is a little bit random and no stability. Between 50 and 150 ppms, we get more a clean cup, a bright balance. The smallest aromas, flavors are coming out of the coffee. And the different, you will notice differences between 50 and 100 or 150. You will taste differences. This water is also in an ideal range for your tea. Going up to that 150 to 300 milligrams of minerals, we know we have more body in our coffee, more flavor, stronger balance. This is a stronger crema on the espresso. This is where the espresso area loves to be. Filter coffee prefers to be lower. And at higher level, TDS movements changes will be less noticed. Partially also because, well, in espresso, the concentration is so strong. But it's also in filter coffee. You will have less notice of differences. TDS more than 500, we have a big problem. That has to be done. What we know about alkalinity? Today we challenge a little bit more than 40, less than 80, although some trends go even higher than 80 ppms on alkalinity. That's that ideal level where my policeman is still there controlling my water, but not strong enough to refuse all my finest aromas and taste coming out of the coffee. So it's about that point, yet it's not so easy to get there. And sometimes we use the wrong technology. That's what we learned today. And we forget about the healthy equipment, which is quite an important point. So we have to look deeper in that one. And then the pH, as mentioned, the optimal, optimal margin is about 6.5 to 7.75. It's very narrow. <coughs> but these are a little bit the ideal world. Now, what's good? What's too much? Not enough magic number? It's about equilibrium. We want to keep everything in balance. It's okay to have lower alkalinity if, meanwhile, all the other ones are also lower. I can run with one policeman if I only have one bad guy. But if I keep 10 bad guys, that one guy will not do the job. So it's about equilibrium, the magical number, magical word in nature. 
And one thing we're using more frequently is the LSI, Langlier Saturation Index. Already in the 60s, Langlier and his colleague Risner, doing similar but the, the same word, uh, values but different formula, they studied uh, theoretical mathematics, how to calculate the risk of scaling in a high production plant. If you have a power plant running thousands of liters a day, you'd rather know what that water will do with the tubes. We noticed that these formulas also apply to us to show us what is the risk, what is the potential of our water to create scale, to create problems in my machine. Langlier saturation index, the top one is water in Belgium. The bottom one is the water in the Amsterdam area. Only difference is the concentration. Now in Brussels, we have average pH around 7.5, 415 milligrams of all minerals together of which about 350 are scale related, which is about um, 20 German degrees. Alkalinity, 16. If I heat it up at 120 degrees, Langlier says definitely scale will form and the water is non-corrosive. For every thousand liters in my machine, I have a potential risk of 250 grams of scale. Well, a thousand liters, if I do about 200 cups a day, that's about 30 days. Um, means that my machine will go into maintenance every month. That's going to be hell of expensive. You don't want that. Netherlands is more lucky. They only would have about 102 grams, but still it will be every three months. So you'd rather find a solution for that. Now notice that the Netherlands, their calcium is about 150, alkalinity 143, but that's not far away from that ideal SCAA world. TDS is higher, but it's not so far. So you notice that ideal world will create some problems if not supported in your machine. Now, that one step further where we're looking today is, oh, what about my bad guys? So an example on the top is the water is softened and I still have a potential of 31 grams, but it's under control. And I have a low volume of chloride because this is a deep water well in Belgium, not much chlorides. Yet today, what we notice more frequently is that the deep water wells are not longer enough to supply all the water. So we're going to start using lakes, rivers to create, to develop drinking water. Now, the water spec can have up to 250 grams of chlorides. It's still within all limits to be drinkable, potable. Yeah, my machine doesn't like that. And even the one on the below, I only have about 86 milligrams of chlorides, and I did a similar job. Okay, I won't scale my machine, but the result is that I have a super aggressive water. Not only the water by itself was already aggressive, but I also gave it a really a hammer to knock down everything in my machine. So water treatment, water development support is getting far more than just scale. It's about looking beyond the box. And this is what about the last page for today on my site. This is where we are today of <coughs> optimal water spec to have. <coughs> Meaning that ideal world would be about 70 to 150 milligrams of minerals in the water. I, if I, I'm capable within our raw system with a blend solution, for example, I'd rather go to the 70s. Because 70 is the, a nice match for my filter, for my tea. Also still great for my espresso. But it's where the, the scale buildup <coughs> line is about. If I stay around the 70s, I have only a few grams in my machine which will build up. So I will protect my machine as well from any scale buildup. Harness between 40 and 120, alkalinity in the same range. Iron, chlorine, we don't want about it. Sodium, I prefer not to have more than 10 milligrams in my water because sodium carbonate will slow down my coffee extraction, make it more irregular, and also have its impact on the extraction. And the pH, of course, the ideal world is seven. You can have a little bit less, a little bit more. Fine, we can work with it. But still notice that from the ideal world to more, if I don't have a correct water treatment support, my machine will scale up. So this is where that next step of professionalism is getting into, is how we can ideally support you. 
And well, this will be for the next lecture. Um, or if you have questions afterwards, I'm glad you answered all of those. Thank you. Uh, yeah, basically, we're going to brew one copy with three different waters that we're going to taste, and then we're going to use that tasting as a uh, sensory experience that we've given to the talk. Uh, so I'll just go and ask the other guy. I'll kind of let you know. Well, you can tell some jokes. Well, I can keep on going on water if you want, or answer yeah, questions. Water. Yeah, let's do questions. All right, let's put back on the back. The back. Any questions around the water? Yes. Why are they changing from chloride to this other one? In terms of using chlorine. chlorine. From chlorine to chloramine. Yeah. All right. Well, because in some studies it's more an economical situation, I would believe. In some studies, chlorine has is a base of cancer. Yet you would have to drink a lot. Um, but in the U.S., they're so afraid of. Um, getting some bugs and getting some claims to put a lot of chlorine in the water. Still, you won't die from it. So by some issues, they found another solution, which is chloramine. And chloramine is a combination of chlorine and ammonia together. Yet, in order to be as effective as chlorine, you need a lot more. It smells like hell. So you won't drink that water without a filter. And it's even more complex to get it out, but a good, decent quality and adapted carbon filter will do the job. So it's mainly about, well, getting safe on the public domain. Um, that would be my idea around it, because it's doing the same job. And uh, if you notice that in Europe, we use 0.25 milligrams of chlorine in the water. In the US, the average is about 5 milligrams. Because they were so afraid that somebody would put a health claim and, and get them to a lawsuit for millions of dollars because the water would not be safe for drinking. Any other questions coming up? Yes? It's not really cool. It's in it's Spanish. It's not. <laughs> um, in terms of the testing of the water, is there any way that we, as a lot of us risk trainers, that we're going around to different sites, is there any way we can test waters in other sites other than just TDS. Is there an option to test any of these others? I know we can test alkalinity and pH a little bit, but what about the rest? Um, the standards are alkalinity, hardness, pH, TDS. These are the easiest ones to test. Um, there are strips available in the markets to test other elements, yet it's within margin of error, which is so big. Uh, it gives you some idea, but not so clear. We're also looking more and more into the pool business, what they are developing, because these guys are getting a little bit deeper into um, test strips and, and test combinations on minerals. Yet we have to see how narrow they are, because we like to be perfect. Um, so if you would, yes, there is technology to available to do all the detailed testing, but it's going to be hell expensive. So today, the majors we're going to test is TDS, total hardness, alkalinity, pH. If you know those, you're very good off. And secondly, if you can get in touch with the local water supply company, you can ask that report, and then you can check if it matches with your measurements. If you're quite close, because water changes all over the world, the, 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 the year of time, if you're quite close, you can say, OK, I can think that's as reliable. Now, you have to notice also that water is not only changing from spring to summer and, and winter, but also in some areas, like let's say the coastline. In the winter, easy, local water supply can do the job. In summer, half of the country is on the coast. So the local water supply is not enough anymore. So then they say to the, the mainland, please people, give us water. So then the water spec can completely change out in one or another day. But also sometimes in the same city, one side of the road has a different supply from the other side. Or what you often had get is uh, you had a, 
a restaurant and they're doing well, they buy the second building and they make an opening and take the whole build, the whole complex. But only on the first building there was a water treatment and not on the second one. Or there was one tube historically with hard water and all the rest is softened water. Please, if you want to do an install on a coffee machine or whatever, check the tap where you're going to fix the machine on. That's absolutely security. Yes. Um, based on your practical experience, what's the best, simple, and, and affordable system on the market for the home builders? Your uh, tap connected or just overhead? Tap connected. Tap connected. Here again, first know your water. Then you can move on. And at all levels, at all volumes, you can have solutions. We're getting pretty far on filter cartridge systems. Yet, Today, filter cartridge will always be, still be, an economical bad solution, but never, a, not yet, a continuous per, perfection. Because depending on the water that's coming in, we're going to reduce or change it a certain percentage and then bring it out. So you will have still fluctuations. If you want to go to the high perfection, then the best option is in the reverse osmosis with a blending option, where you can add yourself with a needle valve, again, some hard water and bring up the TDS to the level you want, because pure RO water is way too low on TDS for good coffee brewing. So it depends. First, try to know what water you have. If you only have 50 ppms coming in, fine filtration carbon block will do a great job. But if in that case you want to go higher because you want a TDS of 150, then it's a little bit more complex. It's easier to go down than to go up. Yeah, it's doable. So it's basically uh, reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is the technology which will allow you to get the most stability. Because there you are in full control. Um, yet, it has to be a food service grade, because not all reverse osmosis are made to make drinks with it. Maybe they're not. They're mainly focused on dishwashing. Uh, but this is where you can go for the best solution. Um, filters will get you close. So if you're had satisfied with very close, filters will bring you, today are already very far, and new generations are coming up, will bring you even closer to the RO. We're getting closer and closer to it. The perfection is still RO. Yes? Um, taking on board is questioning. So for example, if you want to do home brewing, um, and let's just say probably the easiest option will go to have some bottled water, right? And you have to go down to your local supermarket and you're trying to get some nice bottled water to do and or press in somebody's home. Uh, what kind of good, easy to follow kind of guidelines on the label should I look for to get a water that will give me a much nicer espresso opposite to like a tea versus room, if there is such a thing? The basic rule would be look at the dry material which is left over. It's always noticed on it. And if you want to filter coffee, you'd rather go to the lower TDS, 50, 70. Uh, espresso you'd like a little bit more. But if you want to keep the balance, it's, I would stay below the 100. Then you're in balance for all of them. But check the labels on the back. It's easy. But when you do that, please have fun with it and buy some extremes. You can buy bottled water with 2,000 ppm of minerals. It's going to be an awful coffee, but <laughs> please try it. Is it actually safe for regular drinking? Yes, otherwise it wouldn't be sold. Well, I would disagree. There are many things which are sold, and they are quite... Yeah, but I expect that bottled water with a brand has passed all regulations to be sold. It's going to be a very dry mouthfeel. Well, there, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some waters which you use as a treatment, um, as an opposite to regular drinking. So you have maybe two or three weeks of treatment, <laughs> drinking high mineral water, high mineral content water to treat uh, gastric uh, diseases, etc. But then you don't drink that type of water regularly. I don't think you, well, I personally have tried it and I, I didn't like it, so I won't drink it twice. No. 
But it's there. So if you want to experiment, please go ahead, do so. But quite often we hear people saying, oh, I'm buying bubbled water for my coffee machine because with the water out of the tap, it's going to scale up. And if you look at the bottle, it's even worse than the tap water. <laughs> so it's not because there's a brand on it. Please look what's on the label. Any more questions? All right, they're telling me that the everything's ready outside, so please yep. you can join them out in the coffee area. Thanks very much to Ronnie.